Hey everyone, it's Tom here. So this week we have a fantastic episode of Outrage and Optimism for you, which is coming out on Thursday. It's an episode where we dig in detail into a specific issue. And what we do this week is we look at the Food Systems Summit, issues around agriculture, food commodities, how those things are coming together. It's a great conversation and that will be with you as normal on Thursday. But the reason I'm talking to you now is because a couple of other really consequential things have happened in the few days since we last published, and I wanted to just make this small additional episode to help us dig into it, because there's so much going on right now. One of these was around the attitudes of young people towards climate change. This is a really fascinating and alarming study. It was led by Bath University in collaboration with five other universities funded by our good friends at Avaz. And it was across 10 countries looking at people between the ages of 16 and 25. And they spoke in all to 10,000 people. Now, the results demonstrate the severity of what we're facing. Nearly 60% of young people said they felt very worried or extremely worried about climate change. And 45% said that they had feelings about climate change and anxieties and concerns that profoundly affected their daily lives. 56% said they think that humanity is doomed. And two thirds reported feeling sad, afraid and anxious. So this just demonstrates the enormous psychological impact that living with climate change is having on all of us, but in particular on young people who are, of course, the ones who are going to bear the brunt of this over their lifetimes. One other element of this report was that it demonstrated that people who live in countries whose political leaders have not really gotten on top of this issue, aren't really doing what's necessary and are potentially denying the science, feel significantly more anxious than young people who live in countries where their leadership is at least acknowledging the issue and doing something serious about it. What that shows is that actually facing the reality of our situation is one of the ways in which we can dig deep and begin to feel some degree of empowerment towards the situation. It's when it's a dark, unspoken reality that's out there that we know is coming at us and is menacing, but we don't quite name it, we don't quite know what it is, that it has the biggest impact on our psychology. Now, in light of that, today we are going to delve in detail into a really devastating report that was recently released from the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And it goes by the name of the Synthesis Report of the Nationally Determined Contributions. This is basically the adding up of all of the different commitments that national governments have made on the road to Glasgow. And it makes for some pretty stark reading. And to help us through that, we've invited an old friend onto the podcast. David Shookman is the science editor for the BBC. This is a position that he's held for years and years. He's one of the best explainers of complicated science of all kinds, but particularly climate change. Those people who live in the UK will know him well from his regular appearances on the flagship news programmes, 6 o'clock news, the 10pm news. Um, He's really become a remarkable leader and a voice for communicating science to all of us to help us to understand it. I sat down and spoke with him yesterday on Monday and asked him to help us unpack really what was going on in this synthesis report, what it meant, and where do we go from here. This is a great conversation. It's a tough one. It's a it's a let's look at the reality of this situation and not turn away type of episode, but that's part of what's required of us. We'll be back as usual on Thursday. Paul and Christiana will be here then as well, and we will look at the Food System Summit, but for now... Let's delve into the wild and concerning world of the UNFCCC Synthesis Report. Here's the conversation. David Shookman, what a pleasure to have you on Outrage and Optimism. Thank you so much for being willing to jump on. Thank you for asking. At a a moment's notice. We've been big fans for a long time, all the way back to Paris and before. You've kind of guided generations of people through this complex minefield. So great to have you here with us today. Very kind of you to say that. So something very consequential has happened in the last few days. I mean, of course, now world leaders are arriving in New York and we're beginning to get to a point where everyone's thinking about what can be done through to COP26. Can we really get our hands on this? And a really consequential report that was pretty devastating came out. So first of all, this is the UNFCCC synthesis report on NDCs. Can you tell us, first of all, before we get into the detail, what does it contain? It sounds exciting. 
terrible mouthful, isn't it? Uh, an acronym from hell, isn't it? I mean, I, I, and I have to explain this to, to, to colleagues and I need to occasionally pinch myself to remember what it is. But yes, of course, look, the NDC, I think, just translates into climate plan. Right. Uh, I mean, National technically, climate nationally plan. determined contribution uh, you know, under the under the sort of voluntary uh, ethos of the Paris Agreement, each country comes up with its own uh, it, its own targets, its own vision for what it wants to do with carbon emissions, and determines it uh, those those plans itself. So the, the nationally determined contribution, which, as I say, I, I think in journalese we, we have to. We have to strip out, don't we? Uh, if we want to, <laughs> outrage and optimism on. listeners can handle a little bit more of it, but it's okay. still we've still got to be kind. Okay, yeah, exactly. okay, okay. <laughs> so, so the, the plans uh, were, were under the Paris Agreement were meant to be submitted last year, but then of course COVID got in the way, so then the deadline slipped to this year. It was all meant to happen by July, and in theory, in a nice orderly process, as I understand it, every government that's uh, a signatory to, to the Paris Agreement would send in its plan. And the uh, the UN officials would essentially top them all up hmm. uh, and see what they'd come to. Uh, and sort of on, on that level, it sounds quite straightforward. But of course, not every country has submitted a plan. I mean, slightly over half have. Um, of the 190 odd, and for various counting reasons, the total of countries in the world always changes according to how you measure them. But let's call it 190 odd. Um, something like uh, just over 100 have submitted their plans. And so the officials in Bonn uh, did the numbers, totted everything up uh, and tried to work out kind of what that would mean. And, you know, I've got to confess, when I saw that this report, this synthesis report, this analysis of yeah. all of these plans was, was, was going to come out, I, I actually thought it wouldn't be a story. I mean, I, I'm just whispering that because... It's quite mm. embarrassing as a journalist because, well, I'd looked ahead and I'd, I'd seen in the small print on the UN website, they would put out an updated synthesis report, an updated assessment of everybody's carbon plans in late October, right before mm. COP26. So I thought, well, actually, in substantive terms, in, in news terms, that's, that's, that's the, one. the story to go big on. Right. Uh, obviously, because by then, who knows, we might have had China, we might have had India and, and others. And that'll be a more realistic assessment of, of kind of where we stand with 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 carbon ambition. But uh, this thing dropped and uh, we all went through it and there were briefings associated with it. And actually, you know, the but I don't want to sound too jaded and cynical. And I've seen it all before. But I mean, you, you and I, you know, we, we, we've read these these blunt, scary reports about the climate science and what the world's doing or not doing. And, you know, now and again, you can feel a little bit immune to to the yeah. kind of the, the, the bad stuff, the horror of what these the, these little sentences contain. But I mean, this one did take my breath away a bit, actually, because what, what, what I hadn't been quite ready for was their assessment that rather than emissions going down, which which all the science has been screaming is, yeah. is necessary for, for years now, in particular recently, with it's got to basically be halved global emissions by 2030. Decisive decade, halving emissions. Decisive right? decade. Yeah. Cut it down. And that first came out, I think, with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change a few years ago, mm -hmm. reinforced the other day with their last major report, that if you want any chance at all of heading off the really hairy warming later on, you've 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 got to halve emissions by 2030. Well, so this totting up, this synthesis exercise of the, the NDCs, the climate plans, concludes that a, as things stand, uh, we're heading for a rise of 16% by 2030. And I, I, I don't know about you, but I, I, I kind of read that several times and then i rang a colleague to say I i've got this right haven't i 16 but yeah 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 16 percent so rang the news desk and uh we had an extremely brief discussion which which concluded with obviously that's a story yeah uh, uh got writing and um the story was picked up very very widely uh in, in various bbc outlets and programs and of course by media around the world because 
I think it's a combination of things. I mean, we're, we're not that far from early August when the IPCC report laid out you know, more clearly than ever the unequivocal nature of the human contribution to rising temperatures and that pathway, that little table that says, to, you know, to have the best chance of keeping even slightly to 1.5 <laughs> as a rise, you've, you've, you've really got to see a dramatic cut in emissions very, very soon sort of th- through to COP26 starting kind of in not many weeks. And, and really, by the time you get to COP, you need to have got your it's emissions. got to be in the bag, right? In Basically. the bag. Yeah. It's not going to happen during COP. I mean, people often say, well, what are they, how, what are they going to do about emissions and all of that at COP? And I say, well, in a strictly, it happens, meant to happen before. Yeah. So... I the, think the, the combination of getting this absolute body blow from the scientists about what's required, and then the looming deadline of this mega conference, and then right halfway between the two, a report that says emissions are projected to go up, not down. Now, I mean, clearly the key thing to to, to bring out is is who hasn't reported. Well, that's the point. So is part of that number because there are key countries in there who should report and we think will report but haven't yet and who are they and and are they going to i mean that's a million dollar question isn't it now i mean as an optimist you will of course expect a a a wonderfully ambitious uh uh, climate plan to be published by china uh by india uh and others in the next few weeks uh, possibly even in the coming week uh, but certainly in good time for Glasgow. And, well, that, I mean, th- there is the odd hint that that's kind of not impossible. Um, you know, I mean, China, of course, is very important, and everyone always talks about 29% of global emissions, but to get from a projected 16% rise to a 50% reduction of global emissions, right? I mean, that's China plus, 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 plus. <laughs> Plus, plus, plus. You need you need lots of big emitters. I mean, you need the bigger, biggest emitter to act. You need uh, many of the other uh, big emitters to come up with plans. And uh, this is where I think we have to shift from. Well, I hesitate to do this with an opt- uh, to, with an optimistic uh, uh, podcast, but nevertheless, I mean, let's just we're outraged at, too. Don't forget, yeah. <laughs> let's let's. I'm sure that's right. So let, let, let's look at a sort of slightly less optimistic scenario. But I mean. Uh, I mean, analysts have have studied the the NDCs produced by Brazil, Mexico, Russia, which which all actually envisage increases in their emissions. So, um, you know, th- th- they're big players, and if if they had come out with plans that were the opposite, that also would have been a cause of optimism. But the fact is that they that they haven't. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. That there, there needs to be. An, an enormous shift of government thinking and planning and operations uh, in, in, in a number of key countries. And, and, and many have singled out the G20 group of countries uh, in particular for this. The, the least yeah. developed countries said, look, if the G20 don't act on this very radically, uh, we're not going to get anywhere. One of our radio presenters says, so just sum this up. And I said, well, I see, look, we're heading in the wrong direction. I mean, yeah. that, that, that's very blunt. And can the super tanker, which I suppose would carry oil, can the super tanker uh, change course to very, such a very degree, soon? Right? I mean, such, that's a degree, just like, such a degree. Yeah. So, you know, you, you, one does hear, particularly from people uh, either in fossil fuel industries or, or various sectors associated with them, that kind of let's be realistic. Let's be realistic, which by which they mean... 50% cut by 2030 isn't going to happen. So right. I think I think something that'd be a terrific thought exercise is, is kind of what has to happen in key governments and economies and global markets. What would it look like actually for that to happen? I mean, I think we can all envisage kind of what our lives might be like post-2030, getting towards 2050, if, 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 if I survive that long or whatever. But, you know, what 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 a zero carbon lifestyle might look like. Yeah. But I think there's, there's been less thinking about actually what it feels like 
and what's involved to get there. And then and you I mean from you, a political perspective, the individual yes, choices what, of the... What, yeah, yeah. What, what has to happen in different governments, which at the moment are very pro-fossil fuel or sort of antithetical to this whole agenda? What, 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 what needs to go on? Is it ever going to happen if, mm. if, you know, there isn't a massive change of politics in some of these countries? I, I, I mean, I, and I think that's, that's a question that needs to be explored because, as I say, as things stand... I mean, I, I look. I think there is a scenario where we'll get we'll get more NDCs that they may be substantive between now and COP twenty six. I mean, I, I would err on the side of let's be realistic. You know, are they going to get us to a fifty percent cut? No, but would yeah. they signal in some way some kind of shift that might be um, positive in that direction? Uh, arguably, but I mean, I think if Boris Johnson effectively hosting the great event in November puts the chances at six out of 10 of getting movement on. Which is the news today, right? The mission news yeah. today, six out of yeah. 10 chance. He said on the plane to reporters. And he's, I mean, York. he's sort of like recklessly optimistic most of the time. So if that's, you know. He, he yes, that's right. I mean, you know, he's he's well known. He's popular for, for, for what's known in the UK as boosterism. I mean, you know, they're talking right. things up and, 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 and likes to sort of dismiss people who are otherwise too pessimistic in his view. But yes, if he's putting the chances at six out of 10 for, you know, raising uh, um, ambitions on emissions cuts and getting to the 100 billion a year uh, target for aid for, for developing countries, that that tells you, uh, I think, that there's a, there's a little bit of expectation management creeping in now. And so, and so help me understand something there, because I think one thing that listeners struggle with is, is everything seems to be happening at the same time, right? The world seems to be getting ap- getting better and falling apart at the same time in lots of ways. And we should talk about the politics briefly, but also, I mean, I was just looking at a, a panel that's coming out this week in the UN General Assembly from the World Economic Forum. And it starts off by saying 60% of the world economy is now covered by a net zero target, right? At the same time, emissions are projected to rise by 16% by 2030. How can those two things coexist? Is someone lying or what's happening? Well, I, I, I think it's lots of things. Yeah. I mean, I think if, you're, if you've got your target of net zero by 2050, in political terms, that's quite a handy 30 years away. Right. I mean, what, what do you really need to do between now and 2030? I mean... So it's being back ended is part of the issue. Well, I mean that's yeah. likely to be it, and 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 then I, I saw a great tweet the other day about saying what we need is when it comes to net zero, we we need less net and more zero. I mean, you know, how, how much are people going to be banking on the ability to chuck money at forestry in the twenty thirties, twenty forties, or some other offsetting arrangement to to kind of squeak through? a net zero target by 2050. I mean, in other mm. words, how much will they offshore their problems um, or outsource them? And I think that's a whole debate to be had around that. So I think I think that, that one has to look closely at whether countries have, who, which have a, and companies also, have a net zero by 2050 target and what they're actually saying by 2030. By and then actually what they're doing now yeah, in terms of policies and 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 operations and delivery to to make twenty thirty possible, and I think that's where you might get that disconnect. And of course, if you've got key big players not really um, following the rules on this anyway, uh, in terms of timing, that yeah. adds another whole raft of problems. So I have one more question for you. This is really, this is very helpful. And I think these things are very confusing for people. So that's part of what the challenge is, is to get through this terminology to understand what's going on. But I I mean, you know, apart from being science editor at the BBC, you're a keen observer of what's happening from a geopolitical perspective. We've talked already about the road to COP. I mean, I was just looking this weekend at this announcement. It sounds to the side, but of this submarine deal that's happening with Australia, the US and the UK and the incandescent rage of the French and the Chinese. I mean, looking back to Paris, everything kind of felt like it was coalescing towards a moment of togetherness. And I looked at that and I thought, oh my God, that's really bad. Because actually that brings another 
in a context where the Chinese have said, we're not dealing with climate change in isolation anymore. It's part of our overall relationship with the West. And then this happens a few weeks before we're trying to get China to make a big commitment on nationally determined contributions. How do you read that? And do you see that as a, a bad sign as I do? Or is there something else going on here? Look, I, I think you, it, it'd be hard to see it as other than a bad sign in, the, in, in terms of climate action. I mean, I, I always wondered what the Chinese would make of the British chairing COP26 and, and publicly pressing China for climate action while sending Britain's, the Royal Navy's new aircraft carrier um, up through the South China Sea towards Taiwan. I mean, just on that level, how did that... Yeah. How would that play? And particularly, as you say, if they, if China is no longer choosing to compartmentalize different arenas of international engagement, then that that's there's bound to be a connection. Um, add to that this submarine scenario, um, and it's got to take the, the 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 strain in relations between Britain and America on one side and 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 China on the other to, to a new level. I mean. I mean, I, I did see that a report uh, yesterday, I think, or possibly this morning, that you know the first hint from British officials, unnamed, that President Xi of China was unlikely to make it to COP26 in in right. Glasgow. Obviously, they'd been hoping very much that he would come, and I think many others as well. I mean, there'd been a hint over the last week or so that, well, he hasn't travelled outside China since. COVID started uh, preparing the ground, I think, for him to say mm. no. Um, I mean, that that's obviously got to be a blow. Um, I, I, I think I think we are in a massively more complicated era. I mean, you mentioned Paris, and it was very, very striking how in that long run-up to the Paris summit, you know, the, the sort of entirety of the French diplomatic machine was focused on this one issue. And then along came the unbelievably horrific terror attacks in Paris yeah. just ahead. And, you know, the, 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 I remember an immediate thought amongst people was, well, is that going to derail a summit? Is it too dangerous to have a summit? What are the risks around that? And, 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 and I think that the French handled it so kind of well, and there was such a sort of outpouring of sympathy, I think, from so many people that I think, in a sense, it gave a, a groundswell of support, I think, to the French hosting okay. thing Paris. Now, we, we, we haven't got anything like that. I think there's a lot of bad blood by coincidence. And I know that the, well, you were intimately involved in the negotiations there uh, in, the, in, in, in and around Paris. But I remember being very aware, even as an outsider, observing that, that, that Britain was providing the French with a lot of help in terms of engagement with many yeah. of the least developed countries, particularly members of the Commonwealth, and that that all helped the negotiating process. Well, if you've got the French foreign minister saying it's not worth withdrawing the French ambassador from the UK because the UK is just a spare wheel on the carriage of this submarine deal driven by America and Australia. I mean, you're not in a space where, where there's our a nearest neighbour of... is really going to be helping, one imagines. I mean, unless there's a scenario that despite everything, there's a recognition that climate has its own special, unique kind of dangers, planetary yeah. dangers, and, and therefore th th there can be all kinds of drama and yeah. unpleasantness and ructions. And, and actually at the end of the day, Macron and Biden, that they'll kind of resume relations, that actually in the end, Johnson and Macron on whatever, and that at the end, there'll be enough of a dialogue with the Chinese that even if she doesn't come, you know, th there's enough useful uh, progress there. I mean, you, you could argue it that way, but hey, it doesn't look, it doesn't look promising. I mean, it's, I think it's right to compare it with the French handling of Paris and, and, we're, we're not in the same. We're not on the same. No, and, page. and it's a different. It's a different moment, right? I think there's also something about coming off the failure of Copenhagen. Everyone was determined to make that one a success, and in a way, coming off a success, it's kind of hard to follow that in a way with what's next. So I think there's a bit of that going. Yeah, on. I mean, I guess, I guess, you know, Glasgow always had, a, a, if you like, a more awkward sort of set of agenda items, didn't it? I mean, with with Paris, there was, you know, can we get a document big that gavel everybody, moment. Yeah. yeah, big gavel moment. I mean, you know, I know there's talk of a Glasgow agreement and whatever, but I mean, 
it, 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 Glasgow has a different feel, doesn't it? It's like, can it whip up the emissions reductions we've been talking about? Can it nail the 100 billion a year? Can it sort out the awful, incredibly complicated Article 6, the carbon accounting and all of that, which, yeah. which the previous two summits have failed to? Um, so it, it was never going to have a sort of a nice glide it's path. Yeah. It's messier, isn't it? And I think it's become, and we haven't even talked about COVID. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> the complications of, of, a, of a pandemic um yeah. and 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 ra- raging numbers and variants and how you manage an in-person summit with representatives from every country on the planet some of whom are on the british covid red list uh, and all the rest of it i, I mean that's that re- that remains to be issue. seen yeah journalistic cliche well i mean we're going to find out a lot more this week right all world leaders or many relevant ones are in new york so if there's not big commitments this week that takes us down a certain trajectory but hopefully by Friday, we'll see at least something from a range of countries that gives us a good indication. And, and we'd love to stay in touch with you in Glasgow and beyond and chat more about this. So thank you. Tom, Tom it's it's terrific to have the opportunity and uh, great questions. And I hope I didn't waffle too much. No, no, it's fantastic. I think we're, all, we're all stabbing in the dark to, to try to work out what's happening. And uh, let's compare notes as this thing unfolds. Sounds good. Thanks, David. Cheers, Cheers. Tom. It's Clay. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. Real quick before you go. Thank you to David Shookman for jumping on the phone with Tom for this very timely and relevant conversation. I have put his Twitter in the show notes so you can follow his analysis and reporting on COP26 and beyond. And both of the studies mentioned in this episode, as well as David's article on the NDC synthesis report, are also in the show notes. They're clickable, readable right now. So go check them out. Okay, that is everything from us for today, but we'll see you on Thursday for our future of foods episode. See you then.